Good afternoon, everybody. This is Dinesh Singh, welcoming you to this internet-based lecture under the auspices of Vigyan Bharti on the power of a knowledge economy lessons from India's past. You know, as they say in the French language, the more things change, the more they are the same. I have noticed that this so-called lockdown that has happened because of the coronavirus crisis, it has brought about much change. But I find as a teacher that I've begun to lecture much more than what I used to teach face to face in person in classrooms. So the French saying plus a charge, plus a la mom shows is very valid. That it hasn't really changed as far as I'm concerned. I'm, I have been lecturing nonstop for the last so many days. And I'm enjoying it. It is a delight. I've learned much. I deliberately chose this title when I was requested by Vigyan Bharti to speak on a topic of my choice. I think in today's context, when the economy will be affected by the corona crisis and the lockdown, it is important for us to see what worked for India in the past. And take my word for it, that in the past, and I am not speaking as a chauvinist, that's not my idea here. I am basing my points on the back of points of history facts. So if you look at Angus Madison's monumental work on the economic history of the world, and that has never been disputed, and his history, economic history, dates back from the first century AD, here is what Madison records, that between India and China together, we had more than 50% of world GDP share. And in 2017, India's share was higher than China's. We were more than 24% of global GDP. So you can take it from me that India did well in economic terms in the centuries that have gone by. The point to understand is, what was it that worked for India? Why was India able to contribute so much? And it is my contention, it is my thesis, that this was because India was powered by knowledge systems. What do I mean by that? So knowledge was being put to use for the benefit of society. And this resulted in enormous economic benefit. Knowledge was in action. And if you look, at what the Mimansa School of Philosophy says, and it says this very clearly, knowledge without action is meaningless. So then you will agree with me that our ancients understood that knowledge systems must exist and do bring benefit for society. And it isn't just that the Mimansa School of Philosophy said it. I will try and enunciate and bring forth some facts from history. And what kind of knowledge systems did we have? I am sure most of us are acquainted with the fact that we were the first in the world to set up universities. Some of our universities existed from since before the time of Jesus Christ. I'm talking of Takshashila. These were universities of enormous repute. There were other universities. There was Nalanda, there was Vikramshila, there was Wallabi, and there were so many others. And these were enlightened institutions of knowledge. So much so that as much as I have understood, Wallabi also admitted women. And this is several centuries ago. You can contrast that with so many universities in the West that did not admit women up until the 1960s, some of the famous ones. 
and then you will get an idea of how enlightened our knowledge systems were. But let me give you specific examples. All of us know that the Upanishads are historical texts. They are the teachings of the great gurus which are drawn from India's history in the past. And amongst these Upanishads, my favorite Upanishad is the Chandogya Upanishad. And my favorite episode from there happens in the University of Gautam Haridrumat. This is a very enlightened episode. Haridrumat is visited by this child of 12 years of age called Satyakam Jabala. He seeks admission and Haridrumat asks him, we admit only Brahmins. What is your lineage, my son? And Satyakam says very categorically, very frankly, that I asked this question of my mother before I set forth for your Gurukul. And she told me, that I have no idea who your father is. My name is Jabala, yours is Satyakam. Proclaim proud, proudly that you are the son of the maid Jabala. You are known as therefore Satyakam Jabala. And Haridrumat says, my son, I admit you because that is the only true hallmark of a Brahman, adherence to truth. A Brahman is not by birth, only by adherence to truth. You can see how enlightened systems were. And then what happens? Haridrumat does not tell Satyakam to go recite the Vedas. Satyakam is given 200 odd head of cattle and told by Haridrumat, go into the forest and do not return until they have multiplied up to a hundred head, up to a thousand head. And, and Satyakam sets forth with those 200 head of cattle into the forest, obeying Haridrumat. Do you know this is an exercise in practical wealth management? In those days, the wealth of any individual or even kingdoms was largely measured in terms of head of cattle. In this Gurukul, Haridrumat asked Satyakam to practice and learn about wealth management. Knowledge systems in India were connected with practical everyday matters that affected the well-being of society. Of course, the story goes on and it's a beautiful story, but I'm not going to complete the story. Satyakam returns when the cattle have multiplied so many fold and he has acquired much practical knowledge. And Haridumat says that there is enlightenment, enlightenment on your face. And therefore, the point I want to emphasize is that through this everyday practical matter that were connected with wealth management and such things, you could gain wisdom. That is the power of our ancient institutions. They were not driven simply inside a classroom on a blackboard. Gandhiji forever said that in the context of education, what you do with your hands will enter your heart. Rabindranath Thakur laments in his time a hundred years ago, that he says our educational institutions have confined themselves to a classroom and a blackboard. They are no longer connected to the real world. They obviously had such institutions in mind, such as Gautam Haridrumats. But let me then take this story forward. You know, when Alexander invaded the upper regions, northern regions of India in 326 BC, he defeated Porus, which is a great story for Porus fought gallantly and almost managed to beat Alexander. But eventually Porus's elephants panicked and that is how Alexander was able to overcome Porus. But I don't know how many of us know this fact. We were taught in our school textbooks, largely influenced by the Eurocentric view that Alexander's soldiers were tired and after that he decided to return back to Greece. As much as I have understood, there is much more to the story than just being tired. If you think and learn and you will realize that Alexander did not cross the Bias River and it is now understood that Alexander's spies crossed the Bias River and then came back to tell Alexander 
that the powerful Magadan army was waiting across the river. Its soldiers were eager to give battle and they had more than 40,000 elephants. This is what really made Alexander turn back. And he turned back as a disappointed man. But Porus, whom he had respected and they had become sort of friends in a way, did something that cheered Alexander. Porus gave Alexander 100 talents of steel. A talent is something like an ingot in size and weight. I do not know its exact corresponding in terms of today's measurements and criteria. But he gave him a hundred talents of the famous woods steel of India. And that cheered up Alexander. Why would Alexander, who had conquered so many kingdoms, be cheered so easily by being gifted hundred talents of woods steel? There's a reason for that. This steel was peculiar only to India. India's knowledge systems had mastered making of steel we produce the best steel in the world that was that came to be known as the woods steel where was it coming from from india's knowledge systems even in the 18th century when michael faraday tried to reproduce the methods that made woods steel and he tried it in england he could not succeed only india knew how to do that and what was this knowledge system doing for us as a nation? It isn't that only Alexander carried the woods steel. This steel was being exported in great quantities to the Western world. Great quantities. And in return, it was bringing gold into India. Why was that? The famous Damascus sword, which we say referred to in Hindi as Damascene Talwar. This famous sword was nothing but woods steel being forged into swords in Damascus. This was bringing enormous gold into India, enormous wealth into India. That's what I mean by a knowledge economy. Our knowledge systems knew how to produce this special steel that nobody else in the world could. Therefore, we had this monopoly on steel in the world. But it isn't just about steel. We are also great with our knowledge in many other things that we use to advantage in our export trade. I don't know how many of you know this, but from several centuries before the time of Christ, India had mastered the creation of the indigo dye. Again, this is chemistry in action. Again, it comes from the knowledge systems of India. We were the only country in the world that knew how to create a dye from the indigo plant. And incidentally, it's not easy. You cannot extract that color and convert it into a dye. It does not latch onto fabric, even cotton fabric. India mastered this chemical process that allowed us to make the dye perfect for dyeing of clothes. And that was also being exported in great quantities. And that also brought back enormous gold in return. But then again, understand that India was also exporting other things, so much so that hundreds of years before Jesus Christ, Pliny, the Roman historian, he writes that India is taking away all our gold. India was not waging a war with them. India was not looting them. India was just putting its knowledge systems to use and exporting things. Did we always use the land route? And here is something interesting that I want to tell you. It wasn't just the land route. Indian ships used to regularly sail into the high seas, carrying these goods, arriving at the ports of destiny with accuracy and returning back in good time. How did they manage that? And from when were they doing it? Do you know that there is a lead coin that is associated with the Saptavahan dynasty, which was a few hundred years before the time of Christ? which depicts a ship with two sails, two mastheads. That is a rarity. Probably no other nation, no other region in the world had ships with even one sail at that time. But we were using ships that had two mastheads and maybe more. We've only come across one coin from the dynasty at this point. But it gives an idea how advanced we were. There's another thing I want to tell you. 
from the Indus Valley civilization at the site called Lothal in Gujarat, we have excavated a tidal a tidal dockyard, which is based on tidal waves. So when the tide comes in, then big heavy ships can dock there, take goods or discharge goods, and then return. That requires some thinking and some ingenuity to be able to construct such a tidal dockyard. We were the only ones in the world at the time which had mastered that seemingly. I have not seen comparable tidal dockyards in other parts of the world, but I could be wrong here. We had certainly mastered it. And India was exceptionally great at shipbuilding. And this business of shipbuilding allowed our ships to be better than European ships in two ways. One, they were much larger much, much larger. And two, they were stronger. So over the centuries, many travelers from the West observed that Indian ships on an average last many, many dozens of years on an average, whereas European ships begin to have give trouble after 10 to 12 years. So India had mastered the art of shipbuilding. And then there is one vital difference that allowed us to do so well with our ship trade. European ships also used to try and trade. They used to move across and go to try and go to other parts of the world. But for a major amount of time, for a significant number of ships, they would not return. They would lose their way. They would lose their way and sort of crash somewhere or sink somewhere. And they would cause enormous loss to their countries. So much so, that all the major trading nations of Europe, France, Spain, Italy, Great Britain, England at that time, all of them announced huge prizes if somebody, some mathematician, someone, some scientist could discover a means of finding latitude and longitude at sea. They did not know that. It is on record at Newton's time in the 18th century that he tells the British Parliament that at this point in time, science knows no means of determining position at sea. But how wrong could Newton have been? He had no idea what the Indians were doing. Indians were master navigators. And why was that? Well, I have some evidence. One of these pieces that I have learned comes to me from the writings of a British naval historian called J. L. Ride, who says that for many centuries, and this is his learning, India had understood how to use the mariner's compass. They used to call it the Matsya Yantra. It was a fish-shaped metal object made of a magnetic material, which used to be made to float on oil, and it would point in the direction north. It was known as a sort of crude mariner's compass, and Indian ships used to use that. This had also come from knowledge systems. But it wasn't just confined to that. There is a tiny island off the African coast called Socotra. Sometime back, in the caves on that island, some archaeologists, archaeologists discovered writings on the cave walls in the Brahmi. These are sailors who have written their stories. And what are they writing? They talk about how they have come all the way from India, stopped at this island to replenish supplies, bring in water, etc., and then move forward for trade purposes. So you can see that Indian vessels used to travel long distances with great accuracy in a consistent manner. But there is more to the story. India had also mastered how to determine latitude and position at sea through the use of a device that is now known as the Rapalgai or the Kamal. This was a device based on a mathematical idea and it allowed you to determine position at sea. But it wasn't just that the device allowed you to do that. This device was based on sine tables, the sine and cosine that we study in trigonometry at school. So India and Indian knowledge system from the time of Aryabhat, at least from the time of Aryabhat, which is in the 5th century, had produced very accurate sign tables. So these are 
values of various angles when you apply the function sine on them. And they are vital for you to determine position at sea. And Indian sailors used to use these tables. And so they could determine accurately position at sea. When we were at school, I remember this distinctly, at least from my time. I was taught that Vasco da Gama discovered the sea route to India. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Indians were traveling on that route for centuries before his time. And when Vasco da Gama decided to come to India, he went along the coastline from Portugal, hopped from coastline all along till he reached Africa. There, he picked up an Indian pilot, an Indian navigator by the name of Kanak. And Kanak took him straight from Africa, all the way straight to Calicut, through the Indian Ocean. Can you see that? Because Kanak was using the Rappel guy. And Vasco da Gama writes in his memoirs that Kanak used his teeth to find position at sea. The poor man really didn't understand what was going on. The rubble guy had some wooden pieces and pieces of string on which there were knots on a kind of harmonic scale. And he used to hold one end of the string on his, under his teeth, he used to bite it like that and then hold it the other part with his hand and use the pieces of wood attached to it to determine position. But Vasco de Gama didn't understand that. So he records that he determined position at C with his teeth. But this was happening and that is all Vasco da Gama did. He picked up Kanak and Kanak brought him straight. There was nothing like discovering the sea route to India. So you can see that Indian vessels used to travel fairly accurately with speed. They were built well. Even Marco Polo writes that Indian vessels are much stronger and larger than European vessels. Marco Polo came here, I think, in the 13th century. So you can see that this tradition of India as a shipbuilding nation was well acknowledged. Where was all this coming from? Again, our knowledge systems, all these institutions. And I mentioned four universities to you. Actually, large and small, India was dotted with institutions all across the land. And no matter which kingdom ruled how, largely our institutions of learning were left alone and in fact supported by the kings and by society at large because they were bringing value. There were other ways that knowledge systems worked for India. When Chanakya wrote his Arthashastra, he laid down certain rules of governance of law in the Arthashastra. It is a monumental and marvelous treatise. Chanakya was the first in recorded history to use modern concepts of statistics that he invented to allow kingdom to rule well and efficiently. He writes exactly how under what circumstances taxes should be collected. He understood the idea and he understood how to collect revenue and in what form and what statistics could be used. Many concepts of statistics that we use in modern times can be traced back to Chanakya. There was something else because he had laid down these norms of societal behavior, some kind of interpretation of laws or how they were to be used, it came in handy for a very impressive system that Indian society had evolved and which ran for centuries in trade and business. This was the system of shrenis. So in the business of running you know, any kind of trade and business in India, we had evolved a kind of body called the shreni. In society, there were several shrenis the only modern equivalent that I can think of in today's terms would be a modern corporation. So Shrenis ran like that. And they used Chanakya's Arthashas to settle disputes and agreements and arguments between themselves. And that allowed Indian trade and business to function efficiently. And it wasn't just during the time of Chanakya. Shrenis continued for centuries after Christ. And that made our business systems extremely efficient and well managed. As I told you, they are the counterparts of today's modern corporations where you have a CEO, they had a head and the head used to get elected and he could also be removed through a democratic process. So he and he got a lion's share of the profits also like the CEO does in today's world in a modern corporation. So they were really efficient and they were based 
in terms of how to govern and how to settle disputes and what laws to apply on Chanakya's Arthashastra. So you can see how well organized Indian knowledge systems were and how they were benefiting society. The story just goes on and on and on. It, it doesn't end anywhere. I can assure you of this because the subject is vast and it is not even fully understood yet. But Indian knowledge systems worked to the advantage of India. And that is why Angus Madison records that from the first century to the 17th century, China and India together had more than 50% of the world's GDP. And in the 17th century, India was ahead of China at 24.3%. So you can imagine. So there were so many examples and so many things that allowed us to do so well. I don't know if you are aware. The Duke of Wellington gained immense fame when he defeated Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo. What many people do not know is that much before that, the Duke of Wellington, when he was known as Wellesley, had fought a battle with Tipu Sultan. And Tipu Sultan beat him square, fair and square, roundly, so much so that Wellesley fled from the battlefield with dishonor and disgrace. The only reason why he was not court-martialed was because his brother was the governor general at that time in India. That is what saved him. Why did he run? I don't know how many history books teach this fact. When Wellesley came with his army to launch an attack against Tipu, Tipu bombarded him with rockets. Now, rockets were in use in other parts of the world also. But the rockets that were being made in the West had tubes or casings where the gunpowder was stored, which were made of a kind of paste which resembles cardboard. And that made them very unstable and inaccurate. What Tipu's people had done, so Tipu had great interest in science and technology. So he had gotten his technologists to make steel casings for his rockets. They proved to be very deadly and he used them to great effect against Wellesley who ran from the battlefield. So I am telling you this business of knowledge systems working to India's advantage continued for centuries. And let me tell you just two or three things. How could we determine position at sea using sign tables? Because trigonometry was invented in India. Invented in India and then it went to the Arabs and then the Arabs took it to the West. And the words sine and cosine in trigonometry have Indian origins. They were called Jia and Kojia. When they went to the Arabs, they were named phonetically as Jab and Kojab. There was no literary translation. And when they went to the West, to Greece, they converted Jab as an Arab world, word into sign, a pocket. And cosine was Kojab. That's all there is to it. These are Indian words coming from our knowledge systems. And we were very advanced in trigonometry. Not only that, Aryabhat determined with great accuracy the circumference of the earth. He was one of the first people to say that the earth is spherical in shape. In fact, the analogy that he uses is amazing. He says, Kadamb ke pushp ki tara gol hai. So you can see the knowledge systems in India understood very well what was happening in the world around us. And this was being given a practical dimension. Trigonometry became really useful because we understood not just plain trigonometry on a flat surface, but spherical trigonometry. So on the sphere of the earth, and that allowed us to navigate ships so accurately because ships on the high seas go long distances. And because the earth is curved, they may think like they're going in a straight line, but actually are going on a curve. And for that, you need spherical trigonometry. You also need spherical trigonometry to ascertain the positions of heavenly bodies. And that brings me to another story. I don't know how many of you in my audience today are aware of this. The calculus is considered one of the greatest inventions of the human mind. As we have been taught in history, and even when we study mathematics, we are told that this was invented by Isaac Newton in England and independently by Leibniz in Europe. What will surprise many of you is the fact that 
at least 400 years before Newton, in India, there was a mathematician who was also studying the motion of planets. His name was Bhaskaracharya II. And Bhaskaracharya discovered the calculus. You can find it in his works. For many years, I have been emphasizing this across the world. I have delivered lectures in many continents from Australia to Europe to Africa to many parts of the world. And I have consistently said this. Now, Western scholars openly acknowledge that the calculus was actually discovered by Bhaskaracharya. Why did he discover it? Because he was studying planetary motion. And when he was studying planetary motion, he needed to find the motion of a planet, the speed or velocity at any instant of time. The term he uses for that is Tatkalik Gati, which is the term he uses for the derivative. And he shows the derivative of sine is cosine. When Newton discovers the calculus, the word he uses is the English translation of Tatkalik Gati, instantaneous velocity. I am not saying that Newton stole it, but we discovered it centuries before Newton. But the story does not end there. The story continues all the way up until the 17th century. In India, we kept developing the calculus to a very advanced stages, at least 200 years ahead of the Europeans. Only now, scholars of the history of mathematics and mathematicians in general have begun to acknowledge that India actually discovered the calculus. And all these things, I told you the sign tables led to the discovery of so many things, including the understanding of planetary motion. And so they allowed us to discover calculus because through the sign tables, they were trying to understand the calculus, uh, the motion of planets. And the sign tables also allowed ships to find their position at sea. So knowledge systems were forever being put to use. And it doesn't end here. In the 17th century, when Angus Madison says India still held sway over the world's GDP, I have looked at the data of a particular district in Tamil Nadu called Chengalpattu. It is amazing, the story in Chengalpattu. There are just two things I want to bring out. In Chengalpattu, which had a population of roughly 70,000 at that time, about 35,000 people indulged in agriculture. And Chengalpattu's soil is nothing special. It is not like the soil of the Indo-Gangetic plain with an alluvial richness. The Chengalpattu soil does not have that kind of fertility. Yet, in the 17th century, as I have looked, and data has been very well kept at Chengalpattu, we produced in Chengalpattu, on an average, one ton of grain per person. That's a huge record comparable to some of the more advanced countries of the world. What allowed Chengalpattu to do that? Because for centuries, Chengalpattu had mastered the system of water management through what are called eries. So when rainwater came into the land, and it wasn't plenty, but they knew how to conserve it and how to transfer it from one place to the other through a complex system of eries, which unfortunately no longer exist. The areas were completely removed and annihilated during the time of British rule. So we lost that system and then Chengalpattu became deficient in agriculture. So you can see again how knowledge systems allowed you to manage water and bring about benefit in society. But Chengalpattu had only half the population engaged in agriculture. The other half were engaged either in a profession like service or they were engaged in business. And it was a prosperous district. The data over there tells us that it was doing exceptionally well. The story, as I told you, just goes on and on. It doesn't stop anywhere. The point I'm trying to make is that knowledge systems make a huge difference when it comes to bringing economic well-being to society. And let me then come to more modern times. You know, when we became independent, India was deficient in many areas of the economy. I remember in the 60s, when I was growing up, in 1969, when I came to Delhi as a schoolboy, it was impossible to find a vendor who would give you pure milk, not even in enough quantity. Not only that, there was one milk supply agency of the government called the Delhi Milk Scheme. 
and they would give you limited amounts of milk in glass bottles and more often than not the milk in the bottles would be contaminated and not fit for human use i know that those who were not in living in that time who were born much later will find it hard to believe today as i speak to you today india is the largest milk producer in the world we are ahead of the united states also how has that happened because we brought knowledge systems to play and allowed milk production to go forward through knowledge how did that happen well our institutions connected with the knowledge of milk dairy animal husbandry and agriculture they have flourished and they have used this knowledge to advantage so over the decades india mastered the science of milk production efficient management of course the credit goes to one man kurian who really brought about this white or milk revolution in india but it has come through knowledge system and india exports various commodities that come out of milk and that brings wealth into india so you must understand that it is a knowledge based economy that has lasting value and that will shine in comparison to other economies as we did in the past when our steel was so much more superior to other steel and this story is not just about milk india is agriculturally self sufficient today when everything is under lockdown india's go downs our systems of storage our silos etc are overflowing with wheat and rice why is that because we have mastered the production of wheat and wheat we wheat we are amongst the largest producers in the world of rice and wheat that is also coming from our knowledge systems so please understand it is knowledge that brings economic systems to bear fruit for the well being of society and the story as i said is endless but let me tell you something else there is enormous there are enormous areas of concern india still has a long way to go we are making progress every day but we have a long journey ahead and let me tell you what is the real power in today's terms of a knowledge economy i will give you two examples you have all heard of stanford university is one of the best universities in the world in any table where you rank universities you will find that it is in the top 10 or so stanford university has spawned many businesses that come from knowledge in the university many ideas many systems and around the campus of stanford university in a significant geographical region there is huge industrial corporate economic activity all of these entities are directly connected to ideas that have come from stanford university do you know what is the total economic contribution of the small region around stanford university what is the economic in economic terms what is their contribution more than 2 trillion dollars just that small region around stanford why because the power of knowledge allows them to gain an advantage over other countries and other other economies in los angeles county there are so many great universities that allow the economy of los angeles to flourish so well that just a few years ago when i had looked at the data the economy of los angeles was comparable to the total russian economy that gives you an idea of how much power a knowledge system can bring and that brings me to the second thing we have all heard of google and we are so heavily dependent on google for various reasons do you know where that google come from from stanford university and what is the power of the knowledge that they bring the knowledge that they are using is a mathematical idea essentially at the level of undergraduates and exceptionally good programming that allowed them to create the search engine and what is the power of that in economic terms well just a while ago i looked at the data profit loss data quarterly of of google and some of india's top it companies many of which have been in existence for more than 50 years i looked at the largest it company in india which has been around for many decades has at least more than 150 60000 employees 
And in that quarter, what Google had made as profits that IT company in India could not make in a whole year. It was much less in a whole year. And for another quarter that I compared, all of the IT companies of India together put together, their profits were less than the profits of Google. When Google has very few employees compared to them together, nothing. Why is that? Because Google runs on a knowledge system idea. Whereas our IT companies are largely doing manual labor or the coding equivalent of that. That is where India is lacking in today's terms. So India needs to pull up its socks. And we are suffering sometimes. And this is not one day's uh, result. This has been over decades. We have neglected how to put knowledge to advantage for India in many sectors. So I'll give you an example. Our electronics import bill is so large. Why is that? Because we are not making chips in India. We haven't mastered the science, art, and technology of making chips. And that is uh, make, making us import. That sends a huge bill for us. We use a huge amount of foreign exchange. When it comes to oil exploration, if you have to find oil beneath the earth, then you have to use high-end mathematical software. We import the software. We pay huge sums of money and we bring in experts from abroad. Why? Because in India, we have not yet understood how to put mathematics to the use for such things. That is causing enormous loss. These are all knowledge-based economic ideas. There are other areas in which India loses. In terms of cybersecurity, encryption, stuff like that, we have no means of producing things that will allow us to encrypt data. So every time I send a Google message, a Gmail message, or I use my phone to send you a message, which is say through WhatsApp or whatever, it gets encrypted. That is based on mathematical idea. And look how much money they make when they sell these encryption systems to these platforms like WhatsApp or whatever, or Gmail. And where is it coming from? Knowledge and good coding, mathematics and good coding. And we are not bad at mathematics, but we only learn it on the blackboard and don't put it to good use. Mathematical systems, the field of fluid dynamics allows you to design and build aircraft, but we are not anywhere near building great aircraft. We are forever importing passenger and fighter planes because we are not putting mathematics to use. That is why we pay so much money when we import planes from abroad. This story is endless. It is happening all the time. Even in this corona crisis, all the models that are telling us how things will shape up are coming to us from abroad. I don't see any working model coming from here. Not only that, I'm not saying that models should be used, but the British government is being guided by a model that has come from Imperial College, and they're in total and direct consultation with them. I don't see that happening. I'm sure many good things are happening. Don't get me wrong. All I'm saying is that India has a long way to go and we must forever be alert. All I'm trying to demonstrate is that the power of knowledge systems allows an economy to thrive, to do well. And India is second to none when it comes to the potential to generate and use knowledge. That is all I wanted to say today. Thank you very much for this patient listening. Jai Hind. I I'm told that there may be some questions and I try to see how to access these questions. Maybe Vigyan Bharti can help me. Okay, so if anybody has questions, probably they can type in. I can see that some friends of mine are there.
Also, somebody has asked, what are my five key suggestions to make India a knowledge-driven economy? I can only sum it up very briefly that our knowledge systems, our universities, our colleges, our institutions of technology must make learning more practice-based, more practical, more connected to the needs and challenges of the nation. So our syllabi, our pedagogy must be more practical. Gandhiji said it so clearly. And, you know, Gandhi was very well qualified to comment on education. He first ran a school. Then he set up a university which functions still today in Ahmedabad called Gujarat Vidya Peet. Then he set up a polytechnic for women in Vardha, on whose governing body he put India's foremost scientists, Bose, Raman and all those people. So Gandhiji was very well qualified and he says in the context of education, what you do with your hands will work for you. What you your hands will enter your heart. And our education has somehow moved away to the blackboard, to textbooks, to road memorization. When I told you that we teach fluid dynamics, hardly any student knows how he can use that to design a plane. That is a tragedy. So we need to somehow move towards these systems of application. And this doesn't mean that we shun theory or we shun the blackboard. We have to have a balance of things. There is right now no balance. We're just totally oriented to so-called rote learning. And we don't allow our students to think and be out of the box and to question. That is also important. Look at how Haridruma did that way back before the time of Jesus Christ. Then you'll get all the answers. Uh, so there's a question about the new education policy. I am at this stage, I have very little idea. I was one of the official reviewers of the education policy. There are many good things over there. But I have no idea what is happening at this point in time with the new education policy. So there is a question on why we don't innovate enough. And I'll tell you why. Because our systems of learning, starting from the school, do not allow questioning, do not allow generation of curiosity, do not allow things to become practical, do not allow us to learn from each other. You know, I have never understood why in an examination they don't allow you to talk to your friends around you and write questions in an answers in a collective way. This is a very bold and out of the box thing. But think about it because I've done many experiments along these lines for many years with very productive results. The moment you allow children to think fearlessly and to consult others fearlessly, you will find they come up with great ideas. But somehow India refuses to move in this direction when it comes to education and pedagogy. Maybe in the years to come, things will change. I hope so. So there's a question, what can be the best method to model human behavior mathematically? <laughs> you know, when I look at human behavior, sometimes I feel that besides God, no one can really understand it. But no, I'm just joking. I don't know whether you can, there are ways of understanding human behavior and it isn't just mathematically being modeled. You can. There are many things. You know, there is a book that you must read, The Female Brain by Lou Anne Brizendine. It's a marvelous book. And then she wrote another book later, The Male Brain. And it allows you to understand why humans think and act the way they do. There are other great books that have come, but this is a pioneering book that appeared, I think, about 12, 13 years ago. And that gives us some idea of what really is human behavior. So someone has asked, how could I leave excellence in medicine in India's past? Well, it was in my list of things. But, you know, I had been asked to speak for roughly 45 minutes. So I left that out. But let me tell you, it's a great question. You know, India not only invented plastic surgery, it also invented cataract surgery. And... All those surgical instruments, which are really fine, extraordinarily great. They were designed hundreds of years before the time of the Christ by Charak and Shushrut and many others. And they used the wood steel. And if you don't believe me, go to the website of Columbia University where they openly acknowledge that plastic and cataract surgery came from India. But forget them. There is a marvelous book authored by a great surgeon at Johns Hopkins University where he writes about the history of surgery. And he starts by saying that India invented 
cataract surgery and plastic surgery and was miles ahead in many aspects of medicine. So we had great knowledge systems. And by the way, I have reason to believe that these surgical in implements were being made using wood steel were being exported also. And the knowledge of surgery was also being learned from India. So I think that was also bringing in wealth into India. So yes, I deliberately did not mention medicine. I cannot mention everything for many reasons. One, I don't know everything. Do you believe that we should add information about Indian ancient sciences in our basic education curriculum? Well, you know, you should never do too much of this because that makes us chauvinistic. And sometimes then we sit back and say, Hambade Mahanthe. That is not my point. My point is to learn the practical lessons from there. Why don't we copy what Haridruma did? Made learning wealth management so practical. Instead of asking him to sit and recite the Vedas, he sends him to do this practical exercise in wealth management. That's what we need to learn. It will be harmful if we say Haridrumat was great and the Upanishad is great and do nothing. So that's why up to a point it is good to mention these things. But only take the practical lessons that will inspire us, give us strength and in today's context build insight. So... Vigyan or its screen is moving, so I, Vigyan or Ganit. Vidyarthi Prachin, Vidyarthi Bhaut Achche Hote Hai. Lekin Ya Piche Hi Rah Jate Hai, Unko Kaise Aage Le Ja Sakte Hai. Okay. So he says, science and math students are you know talented but they tend to not go forward well i you know one of the mistakes we make is that we have compartmentalized education and put it into silos a mathematics student is never allowed to learn psychology or sociology or disciplines like that there is a story of sherlock holmes written by arthur conan doyle called the case of the, the adventure of the dancing men the story is based on data. It, the detective story is based on data. Data and literature can go hand in hand. But no literature student ever understands how data can come in handy for them. And no data student is allowed to look at literature. So we must bring in transdisciplinarity and hands-on and project work and in groups. And things will change in India connected to the needs and challenges of society. That's what India needs. And I have tried these experiments. Not at the level of India, but reasonable levels with great success, with great returns. So I believe we can do all these things. But there are more questions coming in. But today's student doesn't know what the Vedas and Upanishads are. Well, you don't have to know. I'm not. So the point I'm trying to make is it's not necessary to learn everything in the Vedas. I don't know most of the Vedas because unfortunately, I, my Sanskrit is very poor. I have to read translations. I became a mathematician not because I read the Vedas. I did. There is much in the Rig Veda. I One of my favorite you know, stanzas from the Rig Veda is Ano Bhadra Kritvo Yantu Vishwata. Let noble thoughts come to us from every direction. That's the spirit we must imbibe. Open our minds. Allow good things to come to us. Don't confine yourself to one book or one idea. Be open. Till the end of your life, be open. And you will remain young and innovative. That is the lesson that the Rig Veda really teaches us. Even till this day, I see eminent mathematicians writing that calculus was Newton's invention. Yes, many people write that. But believe me, these are facts of history. And there are many books, not just written by Indians. By the way, the first book that appeared that told us that Bhaskaracharya invented the calculus appeared in 1932 written by two great indian mathematicians vibhuti bhushan dat and adityanath singh lovely book they understood sanskrit well they were good mathematicians but many people scoffed at them now western scholars write openly that it was invented by indians So someone has said the corona crisis has demonstrated that statistics is helping us better to cope with 
handling the crisis than biomedicine. I'm not so sure. Statistics is certainly giving us great insights. So I have been looking at the data of the corona crisis across all nations for many, many, many days. And based on what I understood statistically, I have made a prediction for India, and that has been published in an online newspaper, The Print. My article is there for the record, that India will do far better than many nations when it comes to the corona crisis. Of course, we will do better for many reasons. We have great medical systems. Don't underrate them. I think we have fine systems, and we are handling it as professionally as we can under the circumstances. Also, the statistics is in India's favor. That is my inference, and I stand by it today. As far as I can tell, my predictions are still holding, and not because I want them to hold and bring me name. No, I haven't done anything great. I want India to do well. So someone says, how do we learn more about India's history? I'm telling you the internet is a great source. Just use discerning ability. Apne vivek ko istamal kijiye. Aur agar aap internet ke madhyam se chahenge, to bahut kuch kho, kuch kho ja sakte hai. The internet has many false things. You have to use the power to discern what is correct, what is incorrect, what is good, what is bad. And then you will imbibe enormous knowledge. For instance, I did not blindly make a statement that India invented plastic surgery. It did. But there are many historians, professional historians of science, who have done enormous research, both from the West and the East, who have told us this. And how did I find these sources? Some I had read in the days when there was no internet. But now I find these sources from Columbia and Johns Hopkins on the web. And these are reliable agencies, reliable universities. So then you know that your source is reliable. And you should use that. So someone says many mathematical theorems were given by great uh, mathematicians of the past, but we don't know their names. Well, I can also tell you that the Indian tradition of knowledge made us very modest. We were not interested in claiming credit or talking about what, how great we were. Our mathematicians, our scientists were very modest. They had Aryabhat in his Aryabhati only writes one small verse about him from which you can indirectly infer how old he is. That's all. He doesn't tell you who his parents are. He doesn't tell you what family he has. He doesn't tell you how great he is. Nothing. All he does is put mathematics there. That's something really great and to be admired about this. But yes, it leaves a vacuum. It leaves a gap, a lacuna. You're unable to know what exactly. So sometimes it is nice to know the kind of life he must have led, the difficulties he must have encountered. You know, when he first said the earth is round, there were many who disagreed with him. It is, it is acceptable. It's not necessary that someone comes up with the idea everyone should fall at the feet. You must question. But look at the Indian tradition. When Bruno said, when he put forward the essentials of the Copernican system much, much after Aryabhat, he was burnt at the stake. Whereas in India, even though they disagreed on this business of the shape of the earth, they said he's a very talented mathematician and they made him a professor at Nalanda. So you can see the difference. In the Indian, and this doesn't mean that we are superior, but certainly we have been very tolerant of people whose ideas don't agree with us. Starting from the Rig Veda and all our texts, we have generally been very tolerant, and that is one of the hallmarks that has allowed Indian knowledge systems to flourish and do well. So someone has asked if I can shed some light on ancient ability in quantum physics. I am afraid I know nothing about that. So I really have no knowledge. I'm sorry, I can't answer that. Uh, so someone has asked me to throw light on the works of Panini. This is a very interesting question. You know, Panini is one of the first people to use the concept of zero, not just as a place symbol, but it's a number. 
There's, there are others also, but Panini was at least 500 years before the time of Jesus Christ. And his contributions are enormous. So he invented this perfect Sanskrit grammar, which is very algorithmic. So Sanskrit is very has a very natural connection with things in coding, in computer science. Unfortunately, Sanskrit students never get a chance to learn computer science. And computer science students never get to understand the algorithmic genius of Panini's works. There is much to be gained over there. There is a professor at MIT called Noam Chomsky. He is known as the Einstein of the humanities. Chomsky's, Chomsky's fame rests on his work in linguistics. I'm not an expert either in Sanskrit or linguistics, but as little as I've understood, Chomsky knew mathematics. He knew Panini's system. He was able to extract the mathematical principles, put it into a mathematical language, and create a framework for linguistics. And that is what has made him famous. Look what we do in India. We don't allow a Sanskrit student to learn computer science or mathematics and to see what Chomsky had done, nor do we allow linguistic students to understand much of Sanskrit, much of coding. I know there are some places where change is coming, but we need to accelerate this and be more open, not do this in a narrow way. Allow cross-disciplinary activities and recognize the transdisciplinary na na uh, nature of things as they exist around us. So I also have to think that tomorrow there will be a lecture by Dr. S. Rai Chaudhary, director of the UCAA Pune. And his topic for tomorrow will be the tradition of Indian astronomy. So you are all welcome to take part in that. I think you will really enjoy this lecture. And at this point in time, things are coming to a close. So I wish to thank everyone for this patient hearing and taking part in this interaction with me. I have really enjoyed and benefited much. Thank you very much. Someone has asked me to give my message for making India a knowledge-based economy. Change our systems of learning. Bring them close to the needs and challenges of society. Change your pedagogy. Be more innovative. Don't go directly driven by ideas that came to us from the West to set up our universities. They have changed, but we are still following those old traditional ideas. Bring about these changes and you will find... It will bring about big changes in the economy very quickly, sooner than what you and I can imagine. Google began to make profits in no time. The amount of foreign exchange they bring into America is phenomenal. And it was just a small group of people that did not require any great infrastructure or anything like that. That is the power of knowledge systems. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I really enjoyed this. Thanks very much. Namaskar. Jai Hind.